So let's start. If you remember, this is the this is our overview slide we've been doing in these past several lectures. So this is the image that explains what we've been doing in the last few uh, lectures. We have a data set and we want to fit a generative model to this data set, which is going to be in this class always a probability distribution. Let's remind ourselves again the structure of a generative modeling algorithm. Uh, as in most algorithms in machine learning, we can define three components of a general modeling algorithm. The first one is the model, or maybe more, being more precise, I would say it's the model family, which is uh, the form or the type of distribution that we're going to fit to the data. Um, or a little bit more precisely, what is the set of all the possible distributions from which we could choose our model that will be the output of the algorithm, right? So the, once we run the generative modeling algorithm, our output will be a model of the data, will be a probability distribution, and, uh, and the model family is the set of all the possible models that we might consider uh, being the output of the algorithm. And then once we have a set of possible models that we want to consider, we choose a learning objective, which tells us, which is a way of quantifying whether a certain model is a good fit to the data. And then we need an optimization procedure uh, for choosing the best model according to our learning objective. These are three standard components of any learning model. And so far in the first several lectures, we've been looking at the first part of the algorithm, the model family. How do we represent the uh, this, this probabilistic model. What kind of formula do we use for defining a probability distribution? And, and now in this lecture, I want to talk to you about the learning objective in the optimizer, which is how do we learn the model once we have specified a model that has three parameters, how do we choose these parameters? And so the outline of the lecture is going to be that, uh, the, the, the format of the lecture will be that first we will look at this general objective for learning probabilistic models, uh, and in particular probabilistic generative models called maximum likelihood, we will define what it is and where it comes from. And then in the middle part, we will look at how we can optimize the likelihood based on a training set. Uh, and then I'll have a few comments on bias variance and miscellaneous topics uh, towards the end. Okay, so. As our running example, we're again going to use this, uh, this task of modeling handwritten digits. And here we have this data set. Uh, it's, uh, these are samples from an actual data set called MNIST. And each data point here is an image. It's 28 by 28 pixels. And each pixel is binary. It's 0 or 1. So each image is a 28 by 28 matrix of 1s and zeros or equivalently, it's a 784 dimensional binary vector. And that's what we want to model and we want to define a probability distribution over this data. Uh, and the space of all the possible digits, it's very, or all the possible images is very large. It's two to the power 784 because that's how many, because we have 784 binary pixels. So we have to make some assumptions on the model. We can't just fit all the possible distributions that assign a different value to, to the 174 possible values. We have to choose a certain restricted parametric form for what the distribution over these digits will be. And ideally, we want to find a modeling family that is still, well, it definitely has to be tractable. And we also want this model to be able to capture the structure of the data. So we, we, we don't need to be accurate for, yeah, we, we still want the model to be tractable, but also sufficiently expressive to model these digits and to, to assign high probability to images, digits and low probability to ones that don't. And we saw a few examples of models we could use for this. One example could involve, or I guess there's one, there's, there's at least two approaches that we've seen for defining compact and expressive models. The first one was the Asian networks, and the second one was neural autoregressive models. And the idea of neural autoregressive models was to apply the chain rule of probability to P, 
factorize it into a product of factors, and then each of these factors, instead of being represented as an exponentially sized table, we represent it as a compact neural net. We represent it as a parametric neural net with a tractable number of parameters. This was the strategy that we followed in the last lecture to define the family of our regressive neural models. Now, in this lecture, we want to find a procedure for learning the parameters of these neural and regressive models. And this, these methods will be useful for learning any distribution. So, in order to be able to do learning, or in order to be able to do learning with uh, you know, reasonable guarantees that it will somehow work, we have to make some assumptions on the data. So, machine learning algorithms don't work on any data, you work on data which satisfies certain assumptions. And the main assumption that you make in machine learning is that the data is coming from some kind of data distribution. So these images that I have, they're not arbitrary, uh, uh, they're not arbitrary sets of pixels. They're images coming from a data distribution of handwritten digits, right? So there is some signal to to this data, certain data points are more likely than uh, other data points. And we think of this uh, signal as being, um, as coming from a data distribution. So the, we assume the data points are coming from this data distribution. And we also assume that these, um, so, so uh, there is some distribution over all the images that we might want to model. But when we apply our machine learning algorithm, we have access to a data set. So a data set is a set of n samples from a data distribution. And so now our goal is to, uh, so we have these samples here. We have uh, another example where we have images of dogs. And what we're gonna try to do is, given this data set of dogs, given this model family, which is this region of the space of all the probability, probability distributions, we will want to find the set that uh, we will want to find the probability within the set that is closest to the data distribution according to some distance or metric or learning objective D. Okay, that's the, that's the high level fact. We define the learning objective and we find the distribution in our model family that's closest to the data distribution. Okay. Um, so just to make it a little bit more precise here, we have chosen a family of models script N, and our goal is to learn a good model in theta within N. Um, so for example, again, just to make sure this is really confusing, let's let's look at what a parametric model uh, what a parametric model family might be. One example of a parametric model family could be um, or one example of a model family of distributions could be the set of all the Bayesian networks with a particular structure. Uh, so we fix the structure of a Bayesian net, and for each conditional, we have a table. These tables are what define the parameters of the distribution. So we could consider learning these tables in a Bayesian network. Uh, so, so these are the set of all the possible tables define the set of all the possible Bayesian net distributions that we might have. Uh, or if we have a neural model, then the set of possible models is defined by the set of all the possible parameters that could go into each neural net that's parameterizing a this that's that's parameterizing one of the factors in the chain of decomposition. So the parameters within the FSD and the FDSVN model define all the possible uh, define the model factors. So precisely M is the set of all the probability distributions where uh, their parameters live in the set of all the possible parameters that the logistic regression coefficients might be. Right. So the goal is to then learn these parameters such that we approximate the data distribution well. So the key component of this figure is this D. It's this learning objective that we have to first define in order to be able to for any sort of learning, we have to define what learning means. And there's different ways of defining this. This is especially true in generative modeling. 
indiscriminate uh, models. So in the complex models you may have seen in machine learning before, things are a little bit easier. We usually want to optimize some some notion of accuracy. Uh, typically, we have, or I guess in many cases, we have a well-defined notion of accuracy. We have positive, we have positive and negative labels. Negative labels. We want to optimize our accuracy over these labels. This is relatively easy. So maybe the accuracy might not be exactly differentiable. So we might want to use another objective that's closely related, like the two error or, or the the, the percentropy. Um, there's different ways of doing it, but usually the objective is more precise. Here with a generative model, uh, things are a little bit different. Because a generative model can do a lot of things, it can do generation, it can do density estimation, it can do missing value imitation, it can do representation learning, it becomes much less obvious how to define a good learning objective. So here are some possible tasks that we might be interested in doing with the generative model. One task may be density estimation. Uh, we're interested in directly evaluating the probability P of X. We have an image X and we want to compute P of X. That's called density estimation. Uh, this could be useful for uh, anomaly injection, for example. We want to know if a certain image is, is, a, is a digit or not. We might be interested in prediction, even with a generative model. So a generative model can be defined over features X and labels Y. And we might want to be maximizing predictive accuracy. That's a completely legitimate task for a generative model. Or we might be interested in representation learning or structure discovery, where we want to inspect the model itself. We want to inspect the parameters and try to understand something about the data by looking at these parameters. For example, maybe we have some model of how genes interact with each other or how gene expression levels are associated with some other factors, maybe with, maybe with the genetics, uh, maybe with the genetic sequences or, uh, or with uh, some other factors, some, uh, uh, some molecules inside, inside the cell. We want to know what influences what. So here we're interested in the values of the parameters to learn something about the underlying system. Um, or lastly, of course, we might be literally interested in generation quality. So we might want to just have good looking images coming out of our model. Uh, that's another valid objective for generative models. So these tasks are, well, if we had a perfect model, if we can, if we could perfectly obtain a data distribution, if our model family includes all the possible distributions, then the best answer, the, the, the best solution would be the data distribution, and it would solve all of these problems. But here it doesn't. So we have to define a learning objective which balances across these different tasks. And, um, and so our, 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 our strategy will be to define one particular objective, which is going to be, so this will eventually lead us to an objective called uh, the load likelihood. And this objective will essentially optimize for density estimation. But the hope is that if our model accurately evaluates the probability uh, of, of, of all the different data points, uh, then we will be able to also be, uh, we'll be able to also solve these other tasks. We'll, we'll be able to generate and to make predictions and structure discovery. So we're going to, for now, focus on density estimation. And this will be, a, so the, with the hope that this will give us a model that will solve all, the, all these other tasks. Okay. So, um, specifically, we want to find a theta that's close to P of theta. So, we're going to try to direct now to find a, uh, an objective D that's inspired by the task of density estimation. We will want to define some kind of notion of closeness between the two distributions. And the particular notion that we're going to, so first of all, there's many ways of defining what it is. And we're going to see many examples throughout the class, but maybe the most common way of defining closeness between distributions is using this uh, formula of the KL divergence. Um, you have seen this formula if you took my applied machine learning class. Uh, it was in the maybe it was part of the bonus material, not part of the main material. But yeah, you should have. Uh, you you 
you're likely to have seen this in other classes in machine learning. Uh, so this is the this is called the KL divergence. It is a divergence, which is a little bit different from a distance. Uh, it's a particular type of um, it's a particular method for evaluating the closeness of P and Q, and it's defined according to this formula. So it's a divergence because it satisfies the following two properties. Uh, it's always positive, and it's equal to zero only if P and Q are equal. So you want to minimize this if P and Q are the same. So this will be zero if and only if P and Q are identical. So if you can get it to too small and you can get it to zero, then P should be approaching Q. Um, and this is a little proof. Um, okay. In, this is using this is a little proof that you can look at uh, on your own, and we're using something called uh, uh, Jensen's inequality in the first. Uh, Go from the first to the second block. Uh, we'll come back to Jensen's inequality in a lot more detail next week. Uh, but this is a uh, uh, mini proof. Um, so, because of this property, it is a natural objective to optimize. Um, and then there's also a few, a, a little nuance that I want to point out. With this objective, P and, uh, D of P and Q and D of Q and P are not the same. If you look at this formula, if you were to swap P and Q, you would get a different formula. So they're not the same. Uh, and, uh, and this is actually going to be a really important nuance. So this is the KL divergence. P and Q and Q and P. That gives you actually a really different formula, a really different objective, uh, even though on the surface it's similar. P and Q versus Q, PQ versus QP give you very different properties that we're going to look at in a lot more detail. In, Two-ish weeks from now, and yeah, I guess more than three weeks from now when we look at the ends. Uh, but that's just something to note here for now. Okay, so again, our strategy now, we have this scale divergence um, objective. It has this property that we want. Uh, let's try to use it as our objective D, right? So we will try to, we, we will set D to be the scale divergence. And our goal will be to minimize this objective, d of p data to p theta. And here I've just written out the math for what this means. So we're going to be trying to optimize this specific learning objective. Okay. Uh, and if we can get it to zero, then we will have learned exactly the data distribution. Okay, do you see any potential issues with this strategy? If you, if I so this is now my formula. I want to optimize it. Let's say using gradient descent. Is there anything that, that could go wrong here? Okay, so one point is that the theta of x could be zero. That, does, that doesn't sound great, right? Uh, so that's actually a really good point. It's much more nuanced than the, uh, I had something really obvious in mind, but this is a more subtle point, which will, we will talk about in two to three weeks uh, when we talk about different yeah, we will we will look at detail. We will look at properties of this in more detail. Uh, that, that's a really good point. If, so you never want p of theta of x to be zero, which means that this probability distribution will try to assign some positive probability to every possible input, which might not be what you want. I will come back to this later, but that's a very uh, good point. But I have something much more simpler in mind. What might be wrong with this? Yes, the p data multiplier in part of the log. Like, what is p data? You don't have the data. It's a it's a distribution that exists somewhere. It's like a platonic idea of a of a distribution. You don't actually have the data. You know, we assume that it exists, but we only have samples from the data. We don't have the data. So if you wanted to put this into your computer, you would have to. If you wanted to evaluate it, you have to evaluate the data. But how do you evaluate the data? You just have a data a training set. That's what I had in mind. It is possible to do this in practice by applying something called Monte Carlo, which is what I'm going to show in the next. Uh, four or five slides. So yes, uh, you're totally right. Um, but even before we do this, we're going to make a few simplifications. Again, the problem is that p data we don't we don't have that. So we have to somehow massage our objective into something we can optimize. So the first thing that we do is we know we observe that here we have the log of. Uh, okay, first of all, um, as you said correctly, this is an expected an expected value. We sum over all the x's. And uh, so here in this example, x is discrete, but the same thing holds 
when x is continuous. Uh, here we have a sum of a certain term that's multiplied by a probability. So this is an expected value. This is an expected value of this term relative to where, where the expectation is taken over x that sampled from the data distribution. Okay, so now we have an expectation. Now the term inside the expectation is the log of a uh, ratio of the distributions. So I can write that as the difference between two logs. Now I have log of p data, log of p model. And what's interesting here is that the first term does not involve the model parameters at all, which means that if our goal is to simply optimize for data, right, our goal is to minimize the subjective to find a good set of data, we don't care about the first term, we can just drop it, right? So if our goal is to minimize the yield divergence, this is going to be equivalent to maximizing the, the second term here, log p theta, expected log of p theta of x. And because it has a minus in front, minimizing the yield divergence is equivalent to maximizing this, this other term. And this other term is we, we, what we call the expected log of likelihood, right? Um, let's just stare at this log likelihood term for a moment, to get some intuition for what it's doing. So this is the log probability of the data, of the data coming from our data distribution. Um, it's, the, it's the log probability of the data under our model. So the x that goes inside the log p of theta, it comes from the data distribution. And if we maximize log p of theta of x, we're asking the model to assign high probability to, to to access that come from the data distribution. Does that make sense? So if we sample instances from the data distribution, we want these, we want the data points that come from the data distribution, such as images of digits or images of dogs or sentences that are written by the person that we're modeling. We want that data to have high probability under the model. This is literally what the maximum we have uh, with the expected log likelihood term is asking. Okay. Um, and, and, and we don't, again, we don't care about the first term, we only care about the, the second term. Um, does, this see, does this sound intuitive to you? Maximizing the log likelihood means maximizing the log probability of the data. That's what we want. Okay, but we still have a problem. Um, I guess technically this objective, technically the log likelihood objective no longer has, uh, well, well, it still has, no, it, it still has P data in it. It's, it's the, even though it doesn't appear as obviously as it did before, we still need P data to compute the expected value, but we don't have P, P, P data. So what do we do? We, we're gonna use something called uh, Monte Carlo estimation. So now I'm going to switch to the second block uh, of, of, the, of this lecture, which is going to be about how do we optimize this objective. So we've defined, we've used here scale divergence to derive a learning objective, which is going to be the maximum likelihood. Next, let's look at how we can maximize it. And again, the first issue that we have here is that we can't really optimize it yet because we don't know the data distribution. But what we do have is that our samples from the data distribution. So as you pointed out, we can still use these samples to derive a technique for optimizing, uh, for optimizing the actual expected log likelihood that we're interested in. And this technique will be based on an idea called Monte Carlo estimation. First of all, what is Monte Carlo uh, estimation? Let's say that we're interested in optimizing the expected value of some function g of x, where x is a random variable that's drawn from a probability distribution. Okay. Um, we might not know p or or we might know p, but there's just too many set, but the, the dimensionality of x may be so large that we can that we cannot enumerate all the x's. So we can't actually 
compute the sum over all the possible x's because there's too many of them, or we might not know p at all, so that it's more complicated. What we can do instead is let's say that we can draw samples from p. We, we might not be able to evaluate p, but let's say we can draw samples from p. And let's say that we have generated capital T of such samples that we're going to denote by x1 up to xt. So the Monte Carlo uh, estimator for this expected value of g of x is we're going to call this g hat of x. And it's literally the average of g over the samples that we drew over our distribution. So this should already seem a bit intuitive. If we have an expected value where the random variable is taken from some distribution p, well, we can sample uh, x's from the distribution, take the average of g at those samples, and that should be a guess or an estimate for what the original distribution, for what the, for what the true quantity, for what the true expectation g of x is. Okay, and we're going to denote this estimate by g hat. Um, do you agree that this is a intuitive thing to do? If I want to get the expectation, I sample from distribution. I average them. This gives me an estimator. Oh, this gives me an estimator of g hat. Okay, and then the other thing I want to note is g hat. It's still technically a random variable because these x's. Uh, well, you can view them as fixed, or you can view them as random variables, I guess once we have made the samples, they're fixed. Now G had evaluates some quantity, but if you view them as random quantities that could depend on the randomness of each draw of T samples, then G hat is also a random variable. Okay, so each time I draw a bunch of samples, I get a different value of G hat. So in that sense, G hat is also a random variable. And if we think of it as a random variable, we can analyze a few of its properties, a few of its important properties, such as its expectation. So what is the expected value as G hat when G hat is viewed as a random variable that's a function of the samples drawn from P? Um, well, uh, this estimator g hat is unbiased, which means that its expected value is exactly this quantity expectation of g of x that we wanted to estimate. So on average, the expected value of g hat, as you draw a bunch of samples, on average, you will get the true estimator that you're interested in. So uh, again, g hat, we call this a Monte Carlo estimator for g, for the expected value of g. And it's an unbiased estimate. On average, it gives you what you want. Uh, the other thing is, as you keep drawing more and more samples, right? So you can also view, um, you can you can define g hat as the limit of the of each. Um, so as you draw more and more variables, you can look at what is the limit to which G hat will go as you as you give it more and more samples, and as you give it more samples, it converges to the true to the true um, quantity that you want. Right. So with a finite number of samples, as you reshuffle, as you get more and more samples, on average you get what you want. Or if you take a number of samples and you keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger, and you make T larger, then this estimator g uh, hat will go to g hats of xt will go to again the true expected value. So the way that people think about this is that the images live in some kind of low dimensional continuous subspace, so we, uh, called a manifold of the full vector z. So let's say your your image is a I don't know, hundred by hundred by hundred. Uh, that's a 10,000 dimensional vector. So the, the, the images live in some manifold uh, uh, of, of the full space. The manifold has a really technical definition in uh, differential geometry. I think when people talk about it in machine learning, in this context, it's often meant to be very loosely. It's just meant that uh, there is some kind of subspace that is 
uh, that is kind of connected and in some sense so somehow smooth, but it's uh, it's some kind of weird hyper curve in this higher dimensional space. And it is challenging to learn this uh, this, this 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 hyper curve because it is much lower dimensional than the full space of X's. Uh, this poses this this poses certain computational and statistical learning challenges that we're going to talk about when we will see GANs. Uh, but yes, this makes it potentially more difficult to define gradients. Uh, some some of these. So yeah, for, for example, here when when we okay when we had the expected value, uh, when, we, when we had the Kale divergence theorem, and you ask what happens because you have this division by by by, by zero. This is when if your images are actually on a small subset of all the possible x's, then your objective function forces you to assign a non zero probability to every x that could ever, well, yeah, you, you're, you're encouraged to assign high probability to every data point, but only a small number of them, or only like a, a manifold should have a non zero probability. This causes you know, a strange mismatch of incentives, which might cause the Kale divergence to perform less well. And we will see a little bit more, a little bit more precisely what this means. Um, all right, so just finishing this uh, slide, when you do a Monte Carlo estimate, on average it gives you what you want. As you take more samples, it converges to what you want. And you can also quantify the variance of a Monte Carlo estimator. So G hat is a random variable. We can we can form its variance, and its variance is something that goes to zero as you get more samples. And this again shows that when you collect more samples, you get a narrower confidence interval on the on on the true value that you're estimating, and as t goes to infinity, you get a perfect estimate. Okay, so here I have defined. What is the Monte Carlo estimator? And I showed you three properties of it. The reason why I show this estimator is that you can use it to obtain an approximation to the expected log likelihood. Previously, we arrived at the following objective, the formula that's at the top. And now we can apply Monte Carlo and transform this expectation into an average. Again, the reason we can do this is because we have a data set, which we assume to be samples, in particular IAD samples, independent and identically distributed samples from the data distribution. Therefore, we apply Monte Carlo and we rewrite the expected value as an average over the data points. And this again gives us what I think is an intuitive objective when you maximize the log probability uh, of the training set X under the model, you're asking the model to assign high probability to the data that is in your data set. That's what you would intuitively want to do. And so then maximum likelihood learning is optimizing this objective. Okay, so now we have derived, we have started from the field divergence. And we arrive at this formula, which is a tractable learning objective that, when maximized, approximately minimizes the Kale divergence and it makes our data distribution, it makes our model distribution close to the data distribution. Sounds good? Uh, let's, okay, so, here I have a few examples to maybe better drive across the point of what is empirical. Uh, log likelihood maximization. Here I have a formula, but let's see what it means to optimize this formula in practice on a few simple examples. The simplest example we could have is, let's say we have a data set of coin flips. So we're throwing, uh, now our, our X is a, it's just zero or one. So each data point X is an integer, either zero or one. And this zero or one corresponds to the outcome of a coin flip, which is either heads or tails. And the coin is biased. We want to know what is the probability of a coin falling heads versus tails from this data set. So 
So our data set is going to consist of five coin flips. There's three heads and two tails. And we want to fit a model to this data set. So we're, we're going to uh, define as our model family, the set of Bernoulli distributions. And a Bernoulli distribution has only a single parameter, which is the probability of the point falling uh, heads. Okay. And we want to apply maximum likelihood of learning to learn that one parameter of that Bernoulli model. Okay, so the class of models are Bernoulli distributions, and we want to learn this theta, which is just the probability of, uh, of it falling heads. So this is the formal mathematical definition of our model. We have one parameter theta, and that's the probability of the point falling heads. And this is our data set, three heads and two tails. Let's apply maximum likelihood learning. Let's form the log likelihood of the data. Uh, well, this is this is the likelihood if you take the log and becomes a log likelihood. Uh, so our data set is heads, heads, tails, heads, tails. Therefore, the probability of this data under the model is theta times theta times one minus theta times theta times one minus theta. Okay, so now I have written the likelihood of the data, uh, and this is a function of the this is uh, a function where we have a three parameter theta, and we want to choose the data that maximizes this probability because this is the theta that will assign the highest distribution to our data set, which is the sequence of heads and tails. So what do we do? Well, we can take the derivative and set it to zero, or we can just visualize, we can plot the value of the likelihood as a function of the parameter theta, which is between zero and one. And you can see that it attains a maximum somewhere in the middle here, uh, and it's actually precisely at 0 0.6. So because we have three heads and two tails, 60% of our throws have been heads. Therefore, our maximum likelihood learning procedure says that we should set theta to 60%. Okay, so this works in practice on a small toy case. And we can even prove that this is true by uh, using a little bit of calculus, if we have an arbitrary number of heads and an arbitrary number of tails, our likelihood will look like this. It will be always theta times how many heads I have observed in my data set times one minus theta to the power of how many tails I have observed in my data set. Um, so we can take the log of this, which we can just write like this. So we have log of theta times number of heads and log of one minus theta times number of tails. And where we want to maximize this over all the possible sets of, over all the possible theta. Well, we can just take the derivative of this. So this is a, a one dimensional function of, uh, this is a function of a one dimensional variable. Of a, it's a function of a scalar theta. You can take its derivative, set it to zero, solve for theta. And if you do the exercise, you will find that theta star the maximizer of this will always be number of heads divided by number of heads plus tails. So maximum likelihood learning gives you sensible solutions in situations like this one. And this same principle can extend to more complicated probability distributions as well. Let's take this one step further. Instead of fitting a simple Bernoulli, let's say that we're trying to fit a Bayesian network over for this data. And you can even assume that each Xi, so each Xi is a component of, of, of this vector X. So each data point is a vector. The Xi denotes the components of an X. And you could assume here that each Xi is binary if you want. Uh, and uh, the full distribution over the vector X factorizes as a Bayesian network. Here, PA of Xi are the parents of Xi in the, in the Bayesian, in, in the graph that defines the Bayesian network. Uh, and let's try to apply a maximum likelihood learning here. What would be a maximum likelihood of the parameters? Well, again, just as in the previous example, we have a, well, first let's fix X to be some data point. Let's say 
we're looking at data point. Oh, no, sorry, this is a sum. Okay, we're summing. So the log likelihood of the data is going to be the sum of the likelihood of all the data points. So we have m of them and they're indexed by j. Um, this is just the definition of the log likelihood. Let's now plug in my formula for the Bayesian network, right? So we have assumed that P of P sub theta is a Bayesian network as defined in the first formula. Let's plug that formula into the log likelihood. Then we get something like this. So we have a sum over m data points. And now I have a sum of uh, I variables here. And our goal is to, again, find the data that maximizes the subject. What's interesting here is that I have one set of parameters for each Xi in a Bayesian network. So Xi, uh, in a Bayesian network, each of these conditionals has its own set of parameters, theta i. Theta i is a table that describes what Xi is given uh, its ancestors. In this theta i, it's completely independent. There's no parameter sharing between the different i's. Therefore, all of these terms are in the, the, the all of these, all the terms for each i are effectively independent of each other. There's no weight sharing across the i. Therefore, we can optimize each term independently for each i. Uh, that's something that, uh, yeah, I see your question. That's something that, uh, AML with me, I think we tried to emphasize this a few times. Um, but uh, yeah, this will factorize independently for each. Uh, um, yeah, this, this, this gives us n different disjoint independent optimization problems. Uh, there's a question. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming you, you're going to give an example after, but just uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand. So the X uh, subscript uh, J, these train the these training points are drawn independently from the distribution. The X J, yeah, those are data points that are drawn from the data distribution. But at this point, just think of it as optimal. If you believe that expected log likelihood is a valid objective, then that's just what we're optimizing. Here, L, theta, and D is the data set. This is just the, this is just the definition of the log likelihood I had in my earlier slide, of the empirical log likelihood that I had in my earlier slides. But if, if, if we want to, um, the, the likelihood, the log likelihood uh, requires uh, the independence of the, the training points, right? Uh, yes, it requires the independence of the training points. So we normally make the assumption in machine learning that our data points are IAD samples from the data distribution. I see. That's something so, that we just start with. Uh, yeah, if it's not true, well, you're going to have weird things in your your algorithm might still work, but it will become more and more. It will give you solutions that are worse if it's not really true, and if your data points are fully correlated, then you might get really weird behavior. So, so, so the, um, so yeah, there's a, there's a clear difference between the XI and the, uh, the XIJ uh, and the independence of the data points X subscript J and the dependence between the, uh, the, 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 the dependence in the Bayesian network. Like I'm, I'm not fully seeing yet the, the example of uh, these data points, the dependence in the Bayesian network and how these are like going to be independent uh, dependents. That that makes sense. Just uh, yeah, I uh, I'm I'm curious. Are, are you going to present an example of uh, a maximum likelihood estimation of for a Bayesian network? Um, okay, maybe I should have, but I think I removed the slide because I want to switch to neural models. Um, I just wanted to mention that you know this is uh, this is doable. Well, you can think of in the I guess in the extreme case, if each XI is completely independent of the, um, well, you know how like in a, in a naive base, you just count how many times each variable, uh, 
how many times each word occurs in the positive class uh, and how many times it occurs in the negative class. So that's kind of what's happening. And you can do these two classes independently. You can compute the parameters for each class independently. That's kind of what's going on here. You can think of the parent of xi as being just y. Let's say this is naive based. You have the words here and you have the, uh, the class. So you can just independently count how many times a word occurs in each class. And these things are never, you don't, you don't care about the count of one word, like the count of word uh, I does not influence the, the count of J. That's essentially what I meant here when I said that these terms are independent. Uh, I see each other. You can, yeah, for, you can swap the order of summation I first, then J, and uh, for each I, the optimization, the maximum likelihood parameter will typically not depend on what on the parameters for the other I. Literally, because these theta I's just don't have any weight sharing. Let me switch maybe to the more interesting um, example, which is what happens if you have a neural model. Um, oh, sorry. The other point I wanted to make here is that oftentimes in a lot of classical Bayesian networks, for example, uh, in uh, I don't know, mixtures of Gaussian, okay, in um, in uh, Gaussian discriminant analysis, or in naive Bayes, or in many of the generative models that you see in the first machine learning class, these conditional distributions are very simple. Therefore, there is typically a formula for what theta is, similarly to how I had a formula for the probability of flipping a coin. So each of these theta i's have their own separate optimization problem. And in addition to that, there's also a simple formula for each theta i. That's in classical Bayesian networks. This becomes more difficult when we have a neural model. Now these thetas are the parameters of a neural network that parameterizes the probability of xi given its parents. Typically, we also have weight sharing. You remember, we talked about weight sharing in, uh, in the uh, NAID model, uh, neural regressive density estimator. Here we had we a big matrix W, and that matrix W, its columns were used to parameterize all, the, all, these, uh, all these conditionals or in WaveNet or Pixel CNN, uh, these conditionals are parameterized by convolutions, which are which use the same set of filters for each position xi. Therefore, therefore, we don't have this independence of the different subproblems, and we also typically don't have a closed form expression. We don't have a formula for the optimal theta i. So the simple solution that works for basic networks doesn't work here anymore, right? And so we can't apply a formula anymore. We have to do something a little bit more complicated, which is going to be gradient descent. So the way that we typically optimize this in practice with a neural model is by applying gradient descent. And I'm gonna assume you know what gradient descent is. Uh, here, where we wanna do this hard max, this is our objective. Therefore, we start with a random, so I don't get a high level definition of what gradient descent is. We start with an initial guess for what the parameters might be. Then we compute this log likelihood uh, function. And uh, so that's going to be a forward pass. And then in the backward pass of our, of our, of our you know, yeah, we would apply an algorithm for a gradient, which could be a manually implemented vector propagation algorithm, or it could be uh, using an automatic differentiation engine like the PyTorch, and then we obtain from you know, obtain using any of those techniques gradient, and then we take a step along that gradient, and we get a new estimate for the weights theta, and we keep repeating this, and as we perform gradient descent, we get a theta that maximizes. It gradually maximizes this log likelihood. Now, the, there's, there's one problem that this might have, which is the number of data points in our data set is sometimes very large. 
in order to compute this load likelihood or to compute the gradient, I have to sum over all the components i and over all the data points j. And the data point, the number of data points, which is the variable m, it could be on the order of you know millions in some examples. Oh, wow. And that's typically very slow. In practice, when we apply gradient descent, we use a technique which is also going to be based on Monte Carlo. Uh, we're going to be doing a slight variation of gradient, gradient descent called stochastic gradient descent. What stochastic gradient descent does is that instead of taking a step, instead of taking gradient over all of the things, we subsample a batch and we compute the gradient on that batch. And, uh, and then at the next step of gradient descent, we sample a different batch and so on. And why do we take this batch? What's actually going on underneath the hood? Well, it's actually Monte Carlo, which we have seen before. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, first observe that when we have a very large M, we can do a little bit of math. We can divide and multiply by M, which means that we now have, so, okay, so this expression now kind of looks like an expected value where I have a sum over m terms, and each of these m terms gets a probability of one minus m. So therefore, I can rewrite this gradient as an expected value for the data points, where each data point has a probability of one over m associated with it. Right? This behaves like an expected value where I have a random variable, which is my choice data point. And this choice of data point is sampled uniformly at random from the training set. Do you believe that? So here I just multiplied and divided by one over m, and I have a sum of terms. So this this inner sum this becomes my g of x that I had in the previous example. I'm just saying that you can rewrite this as an expected value, right? So this. Some we basically what's inside the expected value that was my g of x, and here at the top I see that my formula for the gradient looks like an expectation of g of x, where x is my choice of data point, and each data point is sampled uniformly at random from the training set. Now, given that I have this expected value, I know that I can easily approximate expected values by drawing samples, and this is where the batches. Uh, um, the batch is just the number of samples I draw from the training set to approximate this, uh, this average, this expected value. Okay. So again, here, okay, fine. Here in this, here on the slide, I am literally using just one example. I'm literally just using one data point, but as in the other example with Monte Carlo, I can draw a batch of data points and I can approximate my gradient with the average gradient on that batch. And this is where stochastic gradient descent comes from. This is why we're using mini batches. It's a Monte Carlo estimate of the gradient for the full data distribution. So, okay, we also get these two slides. Um, um, Okay, so now we have defined a full learning procedure for other regressive models. We start from the KL divergence, which is a measure of closeness between distributions. We rewrite this into a mm, first into an expected maximum likelihood objective, but that is again not entirely tractable. So we approximate it with Monte Carlo to get an empirical maximum likelihood objective. And then in a neural model, we solve it using a stochastic gradient descent which is, again, another instantiation of Monte Carlo. I just want to close with a few thoughts. Um, I guess there's some statistical issues that arise from this process, and these statistical issues are analogous to what you might encounter in classical machine learning as well. Um, okay, so with really big data sets, you might not have to worry about it as much if you're working with if your data set has if your data set is all of the internet, like all of Reddit or something, you might not care that much about overfitting or, or underfitting. Well, actually, you might care about underfitting. Uh, but, uh, and it's actually a practically important issue. Uh, 
Um, but in practice, when we train models to uh, to do data, or at least in, in theory, when we train models, they don't have an unlimited amount of data like the internet. We might run into issues of what's called overfitting or underfitting for bias in the areas. So I just wanted to find these terms so that you know them. And it's just important to at least have the vocabulary. Bias is a, a synonym for underfitting. Let's say that we have a very large amount of data. So bias is actually something that you might be running into with, uh, with generative models. Um, let's say that we have some very large images or the images are very, very, instead of just having digits, you have, uh, you know, the data set has images of dogs and you know, horses and camels and birds and all of all, all kinds of animals. This is a much more complicated data set than just simple handling digits. So your model might not be sufficiently expressive to fit the data and to approximate the data distribution. Or in other words, in that first figure that we saw, the green blob might be really small and the distance to the data distribution might be really large. In that, in that case, we're not going to be drawing good samples because we can't learn the data. We don't have enough expressivity in our model. And when we don't have enough expressivity, we're underfitting, and we call this problem bias. One way to remedy bias is to have a more expressive class of distributions. Um, or if we have, uh, I guess the opposite of bias is something called variance. Variance is a synonym for overfitting. If we have a tiny amount of data, but we have a very uh, expressive hypothesis class, um, then we might overfit our data, uh, which means that we might be memorizing the data. Uh, and one reason why it's called variance is that when we memorize the data, small changes in the in the training set might produce very different output. Which is why we say that the predictions would have high variance with respect to the data set. So, so this is another problem called overfitting or variance. Um, so bias can definitely be a problem if you have a large data set. There's there was some, there's an interesting paper that came out uh, this week which shows that some of these state of the art uh, general models, state of the art image model, the image general models like diffusion models, they can sometimes memorize the training data, you can, you can find images that it generates for certain prompts that are almost identical to the image that are in the training set. So in some sense, this could be viewed as, as an overfitting problem. So it still generates good, it still generalizes to other images quite well, uh, ones that aren't in the training set. Um, but even with big data sets, it might still be useful to be aware and think of overfitting because you could have the problem of literally memorizing your training set. And you can still be good outside the, the, the training set, but you might not want to memorize your training set because the images of which you're training might be proprietary, they might have copyright. Uh, you want to create new images, but memorizing the same images might be a problem in practice. This is the bias. Uh, oh, and I guess there's a trade-off between the two. If you have a if you have a linear model that's trying to fit this complicated data set, this is bad, it gives you Bad fit. This is an example of underfitting. Uh, and then, the, if you use a more complicated data set, you might have something which doesn't look like the true signal, which is much simpler. And so, there is always a trade off between the two. If you make it too complex, you overfit. If you make it too simple, you underfit. And a good balance between the two is basically. Um, you can reduce these problems by either making the model class more expressive or less expressive. Or for overfitting, there's techniques like regularization, which are still used in large general models, even, even like a couple of weeks ago, a few papers came out that emphasize the importance of applying regularization techniques like dropout in large diffusion models. So they're not these these techniques are still not completely uh, relevant, even with very large data sets. Um, applying weight sharing is a form of reducing that in space of the parameters. And again, the idea of regularization is to penalize the complexity of the of the, of the class of models that we're that we're, that we're dealing with by explicitly adding the right things. Okay, I have one more thing here before I conclude. In everything that we talked about, we 
always assume that we just have X and we don't have any Y. But there are some tasks where we have both Y and X, and this Y could be also very high dimension. For example, in a text to speech problem, Y is Y could be the output of wave net that's conditioned on some text. Um, or if this is a text to image problem, then Y is the image X is the text. In all of these cases, all of this theory still works. We can uh, define, well, I guess here the log likelihood becomes, okay, this is an example of, of uh, image to text. Again, this is a high dimensional input, but we also output a high dimensional object, such as a sentence or an image, and therefore it's still an instance of general models. And we can optimize these models by maximizing the log like the conditional log likelihood, P of Y given X. So given a data set of Y and X, we choose data that assign high probability to the correct Y given X. This is called the conditional log likelihood. It's a valid objective for learning conditional models. And on the assignment, one of the problems is to prove that conditional uh, log likelihood is also tied to KL divergence and the framework that we've been working with in this lecture. Additional models are also an instance of that. Okay, I'll just end by recapping that in this lecture and the previous lecture, we saw neural and regressive models which work by parameterizing each conditional in the chain recomposition via a neural net. Um, ideally, we want these to be fast to compute, ideally in parallel, such as in a wave net model. Uh, another way to do them, uh, another type of parameterization involves recurrence. Store, uh, and we can train them using maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood is a good objective. It uh, is the most widely used objective. It still has some limitations that we're going to be looking at in a few lectures. One example, one reason is that I guess one one problem with the log likelihood is that it's not directly tied to image generation. I told you that there are these different goals that you're involved to achieve, and here. Look like it directly optimizes for density estimation, and that happens to be correlated with a lot of other tasks like image generation, but it's not perfectly correlated with image generation. And so, in certain cases, we might, we might in the future be able to get better models by coming up with different objectives besides the log likelihood. And this is where other models like GANs come in. Um, and then, another issue with uh, uh, log likelihood optimization, well, like an, an issue with our regressive models is that they're not ideally suited for some other tasks like representational learning. Let's say we wanted to discover something about the data. Let's say we wanted to learn some hidden factors of variation in the data or some hidden clusters in the data. We don't have that functionality baked in from day zero inside an our regressive model. But it's still a key task in general modeling. We would want to solve it. So in the next lecture, uh, we're going to look at a new family of generative models called variational autoencoders, which extend the model family with latent variables, which can be used for representational learning. You're still going to use the same one likelihood objective, but they're, they're going to parameterize the model in different ways, which will enable us to do generation as well as representational learning, which is another task. So that's what's coming up next time.